have to play to win. For the love of God and country. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. You can't take it with you. Good night. What's your emergency? Welcome to Aspire. I want to offer you something very special in this program and ask you some questions that maybe people wouldn't normally ask you. Out of all the things that you've had to make a decision about, all the things that were important to you, what decision did you make that you feel most, well, made you the person you are today? What decision was it? Was it to be smart? Was it to be tough? Was it to be right? Was it to be good? Was it to be better than? Was it to be a loser? Was it to be inferior? Was it to be vengeful? What, what was it? What was the most important decision you ever made in your life that most defined who you'd like to think you are? It's not a question that most people really consider. And yet I'm telling you, there was one decision you made that absolutely set your life on the path that's on now, and your life and my life, based on this decision, will never change. You will go on and on and on until you figure it out what that decision is. It's kind of like curly, huh? Life's about one thing. You just gotta figure out what that one thing is. It's about one decision that you and I make. So, before I give you the answer to the decision, I want to ask you, What's most important to you about your life? Because it correlates to this. I was sitting around with a bunch of teenagers <laughs> before I did this shoot. And we were sitting there having coffee at uh, Starbucks. And I was with a friend of mine. I said, let's, let's go have some fun. So we sat down with these kids and they let us sit there. It was about 10 of them. I said, tell me something. What's the most important decision you'll make in your life? And of course, being kids that they, they are, they said, well, what your career is going to be. And of course, the girls, what do you think they said? Yeah, of course, who you're going to marry. So we kind of went around and talked about it. What is your, going to be your career? Who you're going to marry? Those two things are the most important things. In other words, breeding. And then how do you support the breeding? And that's as far as it goes. Kids don't think any further than that. Heck, their parents didn't think any further than that. Throw in a little religion, some politics, call it macaroni, that's a life. But I'm telling you, that is where we make our biggest mistake. So back to my original question. What do you think most shaped you? What decision did you make that most made you the person you'd like to believe you are right now? It's what you decided to call love in you or what you wanted to call love in the first place. Now, most people don't give that any life consideration at all. Many moons, way, way back in Aspire histories in the annals, we did a, a program called The Touch, and we were shooting them in Santa Barbara, California. And while we were there, I made a statement that just really riled people, and I'm gonna say it again. You gotta want love more than wanting what you think is love. And whatever you think is love is what you're going to be held to for the rest of your life. And what do most people think is love? Well, I would venture to say if you're like the most people like me and you and everyone else, we think emotions are about love. We think gratification is about love. We think affection's about love. And we think hate is the opposite of love. That's as far as we go. We never go much deeper than that. And yet I'm saying to you, you have to want love with all of your heart, your soul, your strength. You have to want love beyond what it is you can think and what affectionizes you. See, in our culture, everything's about gratification. Gratification, gratification, gratification. We have too much money in this country. We have too much gratification, too much instant entertainment. We don't even know how to be with ourselves anymore. We've always got to have the TV on. Oh. I'm on TV. We always got to have the radio on. We got to have something plugged in our ears. We got to be watching something, doing something all the time. The simplest tasks of our life don't teach us anything. We just want to power through them so we can get to that Game Boy or whatever it is that we're going to play with, the Xbox on TV. And that's it. Life is about something more than that. And to have a life worth living, I have to begin not to think about my career or who I'm going to marry. But maybe I need to think about what I call love. Because whatever that is, whatever I call love, 
It's going to be the total focus of my entire life. And everything I do will revolve around it. And the sad part is that most people will call love anything that gets them comfortable, gratifies their pain, their sorrow. We're taught that if there's pain and sorrow inside of our life, that we have failed, that somehow we've done something terribly wrong in our life. And that's not true. Sometimes our pain and our sorrow are very good things because they show us exactly where we have missed. And most people are too proud to admit that they don't know what love is. And this is why the world is the way it is because no one wants to admit that the king has no clothes. What we have to begin to see is I know nothing. I know not what I do in so many ways that I have to be willing to look at what's beyond my emotions, what causes my emotions and what they belong to. And if you understand this in any way, shape or form, you begin a path to a life that is lived very well. So when I'm working with people, let's say in a coaching session, and I'm trying to get a student to take a look at their motives for their life and their practice, it's always very interesting because I'll ask them, see how you love and what keeps you from the journey, as Buddha said. And they'll look at me and they'll go, well, I already know how to love. And I'll go, tell me, how did you learn about this love? Where did it come from? And they'll say, well, you know, it's organic. It's inside my head or it's in me or whatever. It isn't. It's something we've made up. It comes from my emotions. You have to understand, the body wants to survive. That's all it really wants to do. It's nothing but a series of habits over and over and over again, trying to survive itself. The mind is nothing but repetition and it adopts the habits of the body and repeats them over and over again with slogans, as I like to call it. It says, well, you know, if you hate the right people, you'll love. If you uh, love the right people, you'll get what you want. Little slogans like that. Well, it never works. So then in session, I might say something like, have you ever considered that how emotional you are is keeping you from love? And they no, no, because emotions are love. I can't help anyone until they have come to a place somewhere within them where they're questioning ever so slightly this thing called emotion and what it's really all about. So take a look at your emotions and if you're honest, you get down to the nitty gritty. If you're just quiet with them and you watch them, you'll see they're about two things, surviving, your hate, and that's what you and I like to call love. That in itself is such an important insight for a person to come to that it will change the whole way in which they live their life. We're not here to <laughs> fix our life. We're not here to have that perfect life. We're not here to do the things that we were meant to do, all that stuff that is supposed to take you out of your pain. There is useful pain and there is useless pain. Useless pain is what repeats over and over and over again, habitually. It's because I never learn. And because I choose not to learn about my emotions and how they act and react with themselves, I never make strides forward in my heart. But the useful pain is when I am breaking the bonds of my emotional premise. When I'm no longer living emotionally, for the things that I have opinionized, or we like to call it believe in, because when we want to make an opinion gold, we'll just say, I believe in it. And then it's done. It's set in stone and gold. And we will worship it for the rest of our life. And we will never mature. And that's where we find all of the things that allow us to hate and hurt ourselves and hurt others and feel rationalized and justified by it. Creativity is the antidote for all of this. The more you start allowing creativity to come into your life and respecting it more than you respect your passions and your emotions, the more you'll begin the process of healing. And I find that in creativity with my students, if they can find it in some way, shape or form, it doesn't mean they have to be world artists or renowned people, that means, you know, you can be creative just washing a toilet. 
You can be creative in so many wonderful ways, in so many different ways. Just finding the respect for that creativity opens up the heart. And ever so slightly, you will find love starting to pour out from you. Love that you can't control. Love that comes from a place inside you that has absolutely no origins and rationale to the mind. Once that is established in you, then something starts moving. Then you want to meditate. Then you sit down and you, you learn. Wanting nothing with all of my heart is what makes love happen. It's what makes your life happen. It puts you in the thrust of your life and in the play of it. And now life becomes a dance, a music. It becomes an energy. Life is energy, a profound energy, an energy that goes beyond what it is the body can feel. Remember, you have two bodies. You have your physical body, of course, and then you have your inner body, your spiritual body. And that spiritual body with those chakras inside of you open up a whole new world of energy, a whole new life in you. Live from the realm of your creativity and your heart. And suddenly, as you breathe into your chakras, as you begin to practice, you find your life takes on a whole dimension. A dimension where you are not living for what you want and what you believe in, but you start living for the chance to breathe and feel real love, a life worth living. It's the first thing that we as humans reach to. We just reach for the hate, whether it be a sarcastic word or it be um, a look or even a thought to our own selves. We have more hate for ourselves than we do for anybody else. And it always seems to come out sideways. And yet it's something that we feel comes very natural and it's not natural at all. Love is what's natural. So what am I really offering to you here? What was I really saying about love, life? What is the unexamined life? What is an examined life? What's a life worth living? It's all very interesting, isn't it? Most people, if you ask them if they have a life worth living, they will defend it and say, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Never met anyone who didn't think their life was worth living. And yet, when you look at their life, <laughs> who'd want it? It reminds me of the Mullah Nasruddin, one of the great stories that the Sufis love to tell about the Mullah. He had a dream one night that um, God came down and said to his village that you could trade your worries. Go to the temple, take all your worries, put it in a bag, run to the temple, hang the worries on the side of the wall. The lights would be turned out, and then you could grab whatever bag you wanted and take off. So the Mullah put all of his worries in a bag, put his whole life in the bag. And as they're going to the temple, he sees all the rich people, the beautiful people, and they have many, many worries. They're dragging great big carts filled with worry. They get to the temple, they put all their worries on the walls. The mullah's looking at his little bag compared to all the beautiful people, rich people, and how big their worries are. The lights go off, he grabs his own bag and he takes off. That's about it. People don't change much. And not only that, but you think your life is bad. <laughs> Everybody's comparing their life, thinking, well, you know, he has a better life than I do. What kind of life do I have? The life you have is based on what you call love. It isn't about your economics. It isn't about who you're married to. It's about how much pain are you in? How armed are you about the way you live your life? How much are you willing to fight for what it is you think you want only to find out that what you want isn't love? Most people aren't even bright enough to figure that one out, sad to say. But there is a way around all of this. If you can develop awareness, awareness that is beyond the understanding of your mind. Awareness is when I separate from my desires, my ideas, my ideals. It happens all on its own. When I no longer want what I think I need, when I no longer desire what I think is love, all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, everything takes on a beauty. It's called awareness. And wherever you go with this beauty, it's all around you. Even in gardens, you could be in a junkyard. You could be anywhere and there would still be that beautiful spark of love and life. My parents never looked at me and said, Gregory, 
you need to consider what love is. What are you going to call love? What is love? Nobody ever does that with their kids. It's always assumed that love is the affection and the prejudice that goes along with that affection of the family. And people will say blood is thicker than water and all that other kind of stuff. All these euphemisms have nothing to do with the meaning of love itself. Love, well, it is something that surrounds you. It is something that defines you. And it's something that you are. There's an old Zen story I want to share with you about a man. He had been taught and told that his answers to all of his questions could be found in an old well. So he spent all of his life looking for a well. And he found a magic well. And he was told that if he stuck his head down there in the well, that eventually, if he asked the question, the well would answer his question about life. So he'd shout down, what is life? And he'd hear back the reverberation. What is life? What is life? He stood there day and night just screaming, what is life? Over and over and over again. And he still got the same answer. What is life? What is life? Nothing changed. <laughs> and he didn't learn anything either. Life just reverberates me and you. That's what love is. It's the well. And whatever you shout down into it is what you get. It is about your energy. It is about consciousness. It is about being aware. Stop trying to make your life fit what you believe in. Stop trying to make life be whatever it is you desire. There is no perfect life. In everyone's life, there will be tragedy. In everyone's life, there will be sorrow. It is so because you have a human body. As Lao Tzu said, if you didn't have a human body, there would be no reason for disgrace. Having a human body is a very difficult thing to possess. Cherish it. Be humbled by it. Allow it to teach you the way of love. If the human body does anything, if our humanity teaches us anything, it teaches us respect for the humanness of us in a very, very simple way. Humble, humble, humble. And the more humble you are about yourself, and the less you identify with yourself as a human and stop shouting in the well what you want to have happen, the more beautiful life becomes. That is a life that is examined. And that, my friend, is a life worth living. Let me ask you a question. Up to now, what has been your life? What Define it. Tell me, what has been your life? Has it been your education? Has it been your family? Has it been your friends? What's been your life? Show it to me. Most people can't. They, well, I don't know what my life has been. I, how do I show it to you? I, I don't. So you go into your bank account, show me that, or how many little kids you pumped out of your body, mm, show me that, or your education, or um, the stuff you have in your garage. Is that what you have to show for your life? What is your life? Most people don't even care. They're so glued to the box or their Game Boy or that Xbox thing they've got or going to the movies or jumping out of airplanes or whatever, working out at the gym. Everybody's into something to what? To elongate your life so you can do nothing for the rest of your life? When does life take on meaning? When? It's not going to be in time. Hey, where's my time thing? Here it is. It's not in here. This thing is just ticking away. Look at the sand. Wait a minute. It's that way, if you really want to know. You haven't got a lot of time, and it's over. And then you think, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I'll just face it when it comes. I've done a lot of deathbed confessions in my day, and I tell you, they're not easy things. So don't think at the end you're going to pull it all together. This life is meant for living, and the secret to life is in the moment you are in right now. Why don't you open that up a little bit? Maybe take some time today, not to think about your life, but ask yourself the question, what have I been doing all these years? Has it just been to survive and get through to the next moment to something that will gratify me? Is that as far as it ever went? Thank you for being with me today. Hope you'll join me next week on Aspire and forgive me for this one, eh? Namaste.
Okay, let's try a little something different today. How about a little Zen contest? The object is to see which of us can identify with the lowest thing in the scale of human values. Okay, you go first. I am a donkey. I'm a donkey's buttocks. I am the donkey's dung. I'm the worm in the dung. <laughs> hmm, what are you doing there? I'm spending my summer vacation. That's what. You win. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, I didn't. Did I? Lagamanga. Can you hear me? Action. Maybe you have the way of schmoozing. <coughs> well. <clears throat> We are not in Cambodia. Dick Nixon. It feels like it, though. I thought I was going to go to L.A. I could have been a movie star. That was nice. Where's Buddha? Buddha? Doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. <laughs>